So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> ask what you want. Yeah. If I can ask, can the rock give us some color around our misora or tradition? I decided to start again. Can the rock yeah. give us some color around our misora? Our tradition, the Rav touched on it yesterday about the, the tefillin, about how they, there were, I mean, obviously Navi is full of long periods where, you know, Torah was almost forgotten. Like, number one, how do we know that rabbinic Judaism sort of won out versus the Karaites or whatever? Meaning, we're, what, how we practice is so far off from, I'm assuming, how Moshe Rabbein or Bnei Yisrael practice. Yeah, yeah. How do yeah. we know that this ultimately, you know, how do we get here? Basically? You know, you know there, there is no question that even the most traditional person would have to admit if we were to be transposed to the past and see Moshe Rabbeinu uh, keeping the Torah, it would not look the same as we do today for a very simple reason, because we have so many Drabanons and Gezeros and Takanos, and so obviously Judaism is very, very different. Uh, but the traditionalist understanding, and this is where you know, or say orthodox tradition differs from the academic approach. The academic approach views all of aspects of Judaism as evolutionary and subject to change. So then they'll, they'll say that uh, tefillin, you know, comes from the beginning of the Second Temple period or whatever they would say. Uh, we do believe that there was an unbroken continuity. You know, the Rambam in the Hakdama to the Mishnah Torah lists more than 40 generations of people who were in charge of the Masorah. Apparently, it was almost like a quasi-official position, a Baal Masorah, a Godol, whose tafgid was the preservation of the Torah Shabbat Peh. And just like lawyers have what's called a chain of evidence or a chain of custody or something, so the Rambam says there is a chain, you know, Moshe to Yoshua, and then he enumerates all the way down uh, to Ravashi. Now, indeed, after Ravashi, there's a little bit of a disintegration of the chain of custody, and that's why you get different minhagim, different uncertainties, and the like. The Masorah is not as fixed from that point on. But based on our tradition, uh, we recognize, of course, that even then, many, many Jews were not keeping mitzvos. Read the book of Malachim and, and, and the like, and the, the, the Nevi'im, and obviously there were Jews, Avodah Zorah, Gili Araya, and everything else. But we always believed there was a faithful core that was holding on to those traditions. And they were Nimser, again, based on the Rambam's <coughs> chain of custody, all the way down to the time of the Mishnah and the time of the Gemara and, uh, and the like. And then after the, after the Talmud, we had the Gaonim. There was a great deal of centralization, meaning uh, the Jewish world looked to the Gaonim of Bavel, Sura and Pompidisa, although Dr. Chaim Salvechik posits a third uh, Babylonian yeshiva. Okay, whatever it would be, but there was a certain centralization uh, that existed. Now, after the Gaonim, that's when we start having real, real differences between Ashkenazim, Svardim, and the like, because there no longer was centralization. Even someone like Rabbeinu Gershom, who was the closest to a centralized authority, that was Ashkenazic. It was not over Svardim and, 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 and the like. So... Within the branches, you can then have individualized conformity. We can certainly trace Minhoge Ashkenaz, uh, whether it's the German variety, the Polish variety, the Lithuanian variety. And then Sfardim, uh, you have Tunisian, Moroccan, uh, Libyan, Iraqi, Syrian, Taman. and the like. And then you have Taiman, which is actually people... Come on, no, there we go. You were going to say it. Well, you're right. People people <laughs> just... So let's hear your dollar. You, you know, un, uh, uneducated people just think, oh, Taiman are just, are, just a, are just a branch of Svardim. But no, Taiman is a very, very separate... Settle down, settle down. Right? Guys, settle down. Guys. <laughs> it's a very separate group. And indeed, it is probably historically the case that their Ivrit or their Hebrew is the closest to what Moshe Rabbeinu and Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov spoke about. Although even in Taimani, there's a large Arabic influence in pronunciation too. So you can't, uh, we don't really have the pure Hebrew. So we can de very definitely trace, as we get closer to our time, we can trace the richness and the particularity of branches of Mesora. But when you're talking about all the way back to Nach, it's very murky. In other words, we have a picture of it, but you have to accept it as a matter of faith, meaning I cannot prove to you from Nach, the text of Nach, that there was kind of an unbroken Masora of Torah Shabal Peh, because the Nach is more or less relatively quiet about it. Uh, so there are a lot of things we accept uh, be Amuna, uh, but as I said, yeah, sometimes history itself 
the historical continuity of the Jewish people might be evidence, min that we're going the right way. The fact that, as Rav Sajagon wrote, Einu manasenu uma el Torah, we are only a nation because of Torah. Without the Torah, we would have disappeared. Uh, there wouldn't have been a Jewish people. Um, you know, Mark Twain, uh, you guys all, you know, you're American. If you're Americans, you know Mark Twain. If you're not, maybe you don't. But a uh, famous American non-Jewish writer uh, wrote, he was accused at one point in his career of being anti-Semitic. So he wrote a, a long article, kind of some of my best friends are Jewish type of thing. But, but in that article, and he was a wonderful writer, he talks about the wonder of the Jewish people, that the Babylonians and the Romans and all the great world empires of the ancient world tried to destroy this little nation, and this little nation survives. And it's really a miracle. In fact, uh, Jewish continuity is, is one of the rayos, that there is a God and etc. And that comes from uh, our connection to the Masora, you know. So uh, that's what I would say. I, but, but obviously, um, it's much easier to trace these specific Masoras like Ashkenaz, Sfarad, Temani than, than it is to go all the way back to the biblical time. Now, Rav Tzad, again, there seem to be two pictures about this. I, I, I want to just mention this to be a little complete. The standard picture we have is the picture drawn by the Rambam, in which he basically says there always was this Torah Shabal Peh, and it remained constant, etc. It was handed down generation to generation. And therefore, even if it doesn't mention it, it's there, it's behind the scenes, it's always there. It's ever present. But then, I do have to say, there is an alternative picture a little bit that's not fleshed out entirely by Rav Tzadok of Lublin, in which he emphasizes that there is no question that the, the, the personalities of the Torah Shabbat emerge uh, during the second Beis HaMikdash and afterwards. Right? The earliest Tana is said to be Shimon HaTzadik, who was a Kohen Gadol in the early years of the Bayat Sheni. And he actually says that religious life in the first temple period was largely a prophetic religion rather than a rabbinic religion in the sense that there was Ruach HaKodesh, there was prophecy. Uh, it was not so much people studying texts and debating and arguing over it. Now, as I say, the Rambam had a deliberate shita to exclude prophecy from the halachic process. The Rambam goes over and over again, ba based on Gemaras. A Navi does not have permission to add halachas. So the Rambam essentially projects backwards in time. All of the machloksim, tanoim, aramarim discussions, he says, it happened in the biblical times as well. Because the Rambam refuses to acknowledge prophecy as a formative influence in halacha. And that's kind of the standard picture that we've absorbed in yeshivos. I think that's the standard picture we understand, that all there is is Torah Shebech and the kind of pilpul and transmission of Torah Shebel Peh. But Rav Tzadok suggests that perhaps prophecy had a much more powerful role in religious uh, life and in religious decision making than uh, we often give it credit for. And rabbinic Judaism is a product of the Second Temple and afterwards when there was no prophecy. So there are alternative views to the, uh, to the Rambam. By the way, Rav Cook points where's out... Where's the Rav Tzadok? Where's, huh? the, where's the Rav Tzadok? Uh, it's in a few places. I, 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 you know, he has a safer Divrei Sofrim, a Kuntras Divrei Sofrim. Uh, those of you who heard of uh, Professor Yaakov Elman, Zechwan uh, Lebrach, who's a very, very, very <coughs> esteemed person, a Talmud Chacham, as well as a brilliant academic, uh, he has a very, very wonderful article on Reb Sadok's view of Torah Shabbat Peh in which he summarizes. It's in, it's in one of the old tradition magazine journals. I want to point out an interesting observation of Rav Cook. Rav Cook says, you know, we know there's the Bavli and the Yerushalmi. Both of them are, of course, products of rabbinic Judaism. But the Bavli is much longer than the Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi tends to be very makatser in sugyas. <laughs> so Rav Cook said the following idea. He says, the, even though the Yerushalmi is certainly a product of rabbinic Judaism, but it is connected to prophecy and Ruach HaKodesh in the sense that if you analyze a typical Bavli sugya, the Bavli, a product of the Galut, reaches its conclusions by process of elimination. It's as if to say, let's consider this possibility, no, can't do it because that contradicts that. This possibility contradicts that. So the way you get to the truth is not by directly coming to the truth, but by eliminating all the other possibilities. 
That's the notion of you're looking in the darkness for truth. So it's not here, not here, not here, not here, not here. Got to be here. The Ushalmi has more of an intuitive approach to things. A question is asked, an answer is given. All of the steps are not spelled out. All of the alternative possibilities are not considered. Rev Cook said that is a type of reasoning that is more intuitionistic, more based on kind of a prophecy or a Ruach HaKodesh. And even though prophecy technically did not exist uh, at that time anyway, but this was a residual within Eretz Yisrael of a certain Ruach HaKodesh that's operating. So Rav Cook is saying an idea that's a little bit similar to what Rav Sadok is talking about. And Rav Cook says it's precisely the fact that we are not on the madregas of Ruach HaKodesh and the like, that we often don't fathom the Yushalmi. It's like the Yushalmi comes from A to Z without spelling out the intermediate links, as opposed to the Bavli that tends to spell out things more because we don't have that intuitionist grasp. Einstein described that was his approach to physics. You know, uh, Physicists say that part of why the theory of relativity is so hard is because Einstein never worked out all the math, meaning if somebody else would have come to that theory 20 years later, a lot of things would have been worked out. Einstein himself said he thought in pictures. He didn't think in logical, linear processes. He just kind of went from A to Z, and as a result, it's very hard to reconstruct the intervening links. Uh, if Cook writes, that is what the Yushalmi is like. So uh, it's very, very interesting that Perhaps there are different models of Torah Shabal Pen and Misora that, that might have existed. Um, so we had a question we started yesterday. Yeah. Um, so far, yeah. yeah and yesterday, the Rabbi mentioned that there are many historical work done on whether uh, Rosh Hashanah was done one day, two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if the Rabbi could expound this, you know, if we can use archaeology to, 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 to you know, find out about. You know, where was, uh, for example, Arabais or DNA about Hilazon? Like, all yeah. the doubts we have, if you can use current data, current science, and current studies yeah. to ascertain the, all the truth back then. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is a very, very fundamental question in many, many areas of halacha, and that is to what extent can halacha be adjudicated, <coughs> reversed, based on uh, factual <coughs> knowledge? that may not have been known to an earlier generation or may have been erroneous. And let me just give you a few examples. Uh, one example is your very question. The Rishonim are debating a historical question. Was Rosh Hashanah observed one day in the Eretz Yisrael after the, the Chorban, or was it two days? Uh, we keep two days because we make the assumption that Bismana Mikdash, I'm sorry, not, uh, after, after the Mikdash even, they still kept uh, two days. So the question becomes, let's assume we could discover conclusive historical evidence that it will be one day, would that change the halakha? Uh, other example, which is very, very striking, uh, the Gemara in Shabbos says, and the Shulchan Aruch so paskins, that you're allowed to kill a louse, a kina, on Shabbos. I can kill a lice on Shabbos, because the easer of taking a life is only for things that reproduce through sexual reproduction, zachar and akeva, and lice, it is said in the Gemara, do not produce sexually, they produce through decaying matter, and it is what we call spontaneous generation, therefore it's mutter. That is a ruling in the Gemara. Now we know that by and large, scientists claim that spontaneous generation does not exist. You will not get life from decaying or rotting meat or whatever it would be. And as a result, uh, there is a tiny Mr. and Mrs. Lice there that do produce. Now, this is extraordinary because Chazal made a halacha kula to matur in Isra Diaraisa based on a scientific assumption that is largely said to be wrong. It's one thing to say we're going to be strict. For example, the two day Rosh Hashanah thing I could give you, I could just push you off, although I'll give you a better answer, and say, well, listen, we're stuck with it. The minute is two days, we're not going to change it. But with the lice, it's much more of a problem, you see, because there, you're monitoring an issue de Arisa based on faulty, faulty science. Uh, right, so that's another example. Now, uh, a third example, uh, which is more systematic, is the discovery of new manuscripts, particularly in the 19th century, in the Vatican and in many, many libraries. Uh, manuscripts, that's why we have so many Rishonim that, that come out, of Rishonim and even of manuscripts of the Talmud itself. Now, 
You go back to classic halachic literature, and the Beis Yosef or whoever might say, we paskin so-and-so because rov rishonim say X. Okay, rov rishonim because he had like, you know, five rishonim and three out of five. We now discover 25 rishonim, and it turns out instead of being a five to two, it's now a 22 to five. So should we change the halacha based on the newly discovered information in terms of girsa, in terms of nusach, in terms of rishonim and the like? Right, that's another example. So let me start with that example because there, there we have the most well documented. So it was Yadua that the Chazenish had a shita that he would not rely on any newly discovered evidence to change a halacha because he adopted what you might call a counter Masorah tradition. He said the following. He says, you know, even if something was wrong, if a Kaddish Baruch Hu, enabled it to enter a certain living tradition of Judaism, the tradition of Beis Yosef and the Poskim. Fish and cheese. Right. That becomes, be that right. becomes, be that right. becomes the halacha, even if factually it is not correct, meaning the kind of the hashkacha practice of God withholding certain information at certain times. Right, so that, that was the Chazanish's opinion. Other, others disagreed with that orientation. I will tell you a very fascinating Ramban now, the Ramban, as I think I mentioned two days ago, came to Eretz Yisrael towards the end of his life, and um, he discusses at the, at the end of the Chumash, a little note at the Ramash, at the end of his parish, that there's a machlokas rashi in Tosvos, what is the silver weight of a half shekel that you have to give uh, for the Beis Mikdash and uh, the five shekelim for Pidjon Haben, machlokas rashi in Tosvos. So the Ramban writes, he bought a half shekel coin from an Arab that was printed, that was minted in the time of the Second Temple, and he carefully weighed it and the like, and he came to the conclusion that Rashi, who had never seen a half shekel coin, Rashi was correct over the Balei Atosvos. And there you actually see that the Ramban said, and this is how we're going to Paskin, because we have measured it. So the Ramban was willing to use archaeology to be machria in a machlokas rishayim. Uh, Kazayas is another example. Many of you probably know of uh, Rav Nassan, Natan, uh, Natan Slifkin, oh, yeah. uh, controversial guy. I, I really, really feel sorry for him. He's a, obviously a very brilliant, accomplished person. Uh, and don't tell anybody. Most of what he said, most of what he says, is correct. Uh, I'll say that unfortunately, you know, uh, this is human nature. A person is attacked, so they attack back. So, so in some ways, his attacking back has caused him a lot of sorrows, although 100% I understand why a person would respond that way. Uh, but uh, one of his big campaigns, and he's not the first one, uh, is the idea of Kezayis. You know, uh, right, uh, right, uh, the shiurim for all the mitzvos, matzah, mar, whatever it is, you've got to eat a Kezayis. How big is a Kezayis? A tennis ball? A bowling ball? What, what, is, a, what is a Kezayis? A Kezayis means an olive. The volume of an olive. Okay, there are big olives, there are small olives. Take your biggest olive. It's a big olive, let's say. Even though halakhically it's a middle olive, but let's, let's take it a big olive. You're not going to get, you know, a whole matzah shmura, whatever it would be. So uh, they start debating, well, we have to pass it, that the olives used to be gigantic in those days, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, and therefore we got to go with the original size of the Zayas, but then we have, you're 100% correct, we have archaeological evidence that the Gezaisim were either the same or maybe were smaller, right? We don't find like super gigantic olives or, or whatever it is. So what does that mean? Does that mean a Gezaias should be, you know, a little piece of matzah? Now the truth of the matter is, in, in the old Lithuanian tradition, it's, it's recorded of Chaim Volazhin, of Chaim of Volazhin told people if you take a piece of matzah that covers your palm, your palm, not even your fingers, that's a kazayas, kazayas, which roughly would be, you know, a big olive if you'd crush it up and the like. So it's very confusing. Again, some say once it becomes part of the Masoira, you got to follow it. Others say, realistically, these things ought to be changed by facts. Now, with respect to kina, kina is probably analytically the most difficult problem. I mean, let me just point out, that Rav Dessler adopts 
what you might call a mystical theory of halacha. Rav Dessler says, Hashem would never allow Chazal to make mistakes and mislead Am Yisrael. What about the power of Elam Davar? Yeah, well, we do. Yeah, you're right. That, that's one instance where, where it yeah. does happen. Uh, but at least maybe when there's no base on Mikdash, she says, you know, there's no corrective mechanism. So he says, if Chazal matured Kina, it must be that it is mutter, even though the reason they gave was an incorrect reason. <laughs> it, it's very reminiscent of a famous Misa involving Rav Chaim Salvechik. Rav Chaim Salvechik, the great uh, Goyen of Brisk, known for his deep, right, the deepest of analytical thinkers. Rav Chaim notoriously hated to paskin Shilas. He refused to paskin. Even in, he was the Rav of Brisk. He, he would not paskin Shilas and Brisk. He had Dayonim. And when Rav Chaim had a difficult Shaila, he would send it to the Posei Kador, who was Rav Yitzchok Ochan Inspector. YU is named after Rav Yitzchok Ochan Inspector. So legend has it, I can't say that it's true, that whenever he would send a Shaila to Yitzchok Ochan Inspector, he would say, please give me your psak. Just tell me, Mutter or Usser, don't give me, I don't want to hear any reasons. Why? Because your reasons I'll probably argue with. Your logic is probably faulty based on my brisker amkus and the like. But I believe as Pose Kador, you'll come to the right answer, even if you have the wrong reason. That's a very mystical theory of halacha, but it's kind of what Rev. Dessler is saying about Harigas Kina. So this is a very long-winded non-answer to your question. I mean, I realize your question basically is, can we change halacha based on factual discoveries? It really depends on the idea of whether errors in the Mesorah get assimilated into the Mesorah itself, and do I regard that as a hashkacha practice, that it was the Ratzon Hashem, that halacha move in a certain direction, even if that was not a factually accurate situation. <laughs> Excuse me, the Chazanish, I think, would take the position that things don't change. Others might be a bit more, more progressive. Now, again, uh, even if you believe things change, God forbid, don't confuse that with reform. It's, it's very much, I mean, it's very much the opposite. Reform is changing. Here, we're trying to come in connection to what was the original Matthias. It's, it's, it, you know, it, superficially, it may sound like a reform type of thing, but analytically, it's exactly the opposite pr process. It's la hachzer Torah. So it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard question. Oh, let me give you another example that's very fascinating. It comes up a lot. Those of you, maybe some of you have learned this. Uh, the status of stainless steel pots and bulia. You know, it's axiomatic. Right? The first law you learn in Hilchos Tashras is that a pot absorbs that which you cook in it, whether it's treif or whether it's milchik or fleshik. And as a result, uh, if you cook uh, uh, you know, meat in a milkshake pot or you cook kosher in a trace pot, the, that which is absorbed goes into the food and unless you have 60, et cetera, right? This is the, the basic structure of why you need separate milkshake, fleshic stuff, why you have to kosher uh, trace kitchens. So scientists now say that stainless steel, they've, they test it, actually does not absorb any detectable food residue bichlal, that the whole concept of modern iron, or cast iron does, right? Or if, if you have, there are materials that do. The materials in Chazal's time did, but tempered steel actually does not seem to have absorbent properties. So the question now becomes, so are we going to now take the position, I can use a stainless steel pot for milchiks and fleshiks, because there's no milk that was absorbed, there's no meat that was absorbed, I don't have to cast your stainless steel, it's a lively debate. Um, there are those who actually take the position that stainless steel uh, does not have to be kashered at all. That's a minority position, as you said. Others say, you know, we have this Messiah that everything that's metal is balea. Uh, we are not allowed to kind of make changes in those assumptions. So the controversy comes across in many, 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 many areas. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's another very good example. Uh, the Aguna issues, uh, we don't mean the Aguna of the guy who doesn't want to give a get, but the original Aguna issue of the missing in, missing in action husband. We don't know if he's dead or alive, aftermath of 9-11 or the like. 
and sometimes we recover bodies that are not physically recognizable, but through uh, DNA, we might be able to determine identity. So could we use DNA to matir anaguna? So uh, famously, you know, uh, Rebel Yashav actually said no. Rebel Yashav took the position that DNA uh, was not considered edus, and you could not matir anaguna. Uh, there are others, other post him who, who say very much incorrect that Vada DNA could be used. So that's a live machlokas. Now I will tell you the Rabbanut does not allow DNA testing to establish, well, when there are paternity actions, right? So uh, they will not allow a DNA test because they don't want to create a Suffolk Mamzer because what if the DNA test shows that the kid is not from the husband? Could DNA be Kovea that someone is a Mamzer? Now, according to Rabbi Yashiv, not. That's actually the, the plus side of Rabbi Yashiv's side. But if you consider DNA is sufficient to matcher an aguna, then it would appear DNA would be sufficient to matcher mamzerus. And the Rabbanut took the position, it's kind of a strange position, of just look the other way, meaning we will not allow a DNA test in order not to create a suffix of mamzerus. Because in the absence of the test, we have a klau, rov bi ilos achar habal that a married woman normally has relations with her husband. So even if the kid looks differently. So without a DNA test, the child will have a cheskes kashras. They will not allow a DNA test to cast dispersions on the child's child's yichas. So it's not so posh, but that's another example of new technology. Now I want to say something. I remember reading, after I, I read Rav Yasha's psaq, that DNA is not uh, not good, I think to myself, you know, come on. They say it's a one in a billion chance that it's off, etc. But I saw an article in the Atlantic. I was on an airplane, so Atlantic was there. And they actually say that although if a DNA test is done correctly, like it's one in a billion that it's wrong, but he said there's a surprising margin of error in the people who do the tests and, and, and set up the conditions. And he said it could be off as high as 25%. Uh, and indeed, there's a whole project in the United States, Innocence Project, which is getting guys, getting people off death, death row who uh, were uh, convicted. No, that, that's correct. Sometimes that's doing DNA, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but sometimes they also redo the DNA and they discover they discover testing errors. So, well, we should may have a point that uh, DNA, the testing itself, the protocol, may be tainted in, in, in various ways. One question, one question. There's a few more people left. this. One question. Come back to you, can I make? Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult question, right? Because I'll say, if a person says, Echta, I'll do sins, V'yashuv and I'll do tshuva, ain mas pikin. Hashem will not give you the opportunity to do tshuva. So first of all, let me just point out, the Rambam himself says, it doesn't say you can't do tshuva, it just says God is not going to make it easy for you, which means you can do tshuva even for that. But I think the most important insight here is that of the Balatanya. The Balatanya writes, and he has something in the third, parak, the third section of Tanya, is a letter he wrote called Igeres HaTshuva. The Balatanya wrote on, on Shuva himself. And he says, Echte V'yashuv doesn't just mean, I know I'm going to sin. It means, I don't care. It means, 
I'm looking forward to sinning again because I know I'll get out of it by doing tshuva. That is considered to be a hypocritical tshuva. That's not a real tshuva because you're just doing it as I'll pay the admission and then I'll go back. But if a person truly wishes, my rutzon is, I don't want to do the sin. But I recognize factually that I'm weak and I'm prone to error and I can be tempted. That's bichlal, not echta biyosha, because at the time you're doing tshuva, you really wish, hopefully, you wish, l'chala pachas, that you'd be out of there. You wouldn't be connected to that avera. You're just worried that, practically speaking, you tend to, uh, all of us tend to get stuck. So that's not bichlal, echta biyosha. In fact, um, some of you might have heard of uh, Rav Shlomo Hoffman, a chash of a person. He uh, was one of the prominent therapists in the Haredi community. Many gedolim trusted him, Rav Shach, and they would send Talmidim of yeshivas and, uh, to him for various treatment. He's a man who had great, great psychological insight uh, grounded in Torah, and uh, his writings are being printed now, so you can actually something to get, both in Hebrew and in English. So he tells an interesting story. He says that he was a Talmud in the Hebron yeshiva. And it was Elul, and as is the want of people in Lipashi yeshivas, he was very depressed uh, during, the, during the month of Elul. Uh, and he... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And uh, one of the Rashi yeshivas uh, saw him and said, what are you so depressed about? What are you so sad about? He says, I'm reading the Rambam. And the Rambam says, what is tshuva? Not even Shuvah Gemurah. What is Shuva? Only when Hashem, the Odea Talumais, the one who knows all secrets, can testify. Shalom Yashuv Lazah Hachet Liolam. God is your witness. You will never do the sin again. That is Shuva. When God, who of course knows the future, testifies, I'm out of there. So Shlomo Hoffman said to his Rosh Hashiva, what am I supposed to make with that? I'm not going to, you know, I do tshuva on Lashon Hara, I'm going to speak Lashon Hara again. Shmir Sinayim, whatever the Aver is, I'm going to do it again. What? So that means I haven't done tshuva. My tshuva is nothing. So the Rosh Hashiva didn't fan for the Rambam, although, you know, we could talk about that too. The Rosh Hashiva said, who says you follow the Rambam anyway? You know, the Rambam is not the only posek in Hilchas Tshuva. We have another great posek in the Yonim of Shuvah, that's Rabbeinu Yona, in the Sefer Shari Tshuva. And in the Sefer Shari Tshuva, Rabbeinu Yona says, Tshuva is committing yourself to a certain road. There is the road of life, the road of death, the road of evil, the road of good. Tshuva is when I say to Hashem, sincerely, I want to go on the right road. It doesn't mean you'll get to the destination, it doesn't mean you're not going to fail. It doesn't mean you're not going to detour. But you're declaring with sincerity, I want to try to walk in the right path. And the Roshiva told Rav Hoffman, this is how we paskin, Avaita Satshuva is. So it does require sincerity. That much I can't, I can't take away that requirement. I can't punch in that one. But if I sincerely want to improve myself, even though I have this feeling based on past experience, that, you know, I'm likely to slip in various ways, that doesn't negate my tshuva if, I re if, if what I really want to do is walk on the, on the right road. I also want to point out that progress is not all or nothing. So, for example, if a person had, whatever it is, five episodes of Shmira Senayim, you know, however you define that, uh, and you get it down to four, then, you know, you have, you have improved. You're not, in fact, I can even say that in the Rambam. When the Rambam says, you will not go back to the sin again, he means you won't go back to the sin to the same degree you went back then. I made an improvement. You know, I remember hearing a word from Rabbi Sofer Fran. Some of you might, might have heard of him. Uh, he was an old, he's no older than me, but he was an old, he was my ultra bucker when I was in yeshiva. Uh, so Rabbi Fran said a gewaldic of words. He said that Maishu Rabbeinu hits the rock uh, in the 40th year in the desert, and because he's angry at B'nai Israel, and Hashem you know, said you can't go in because of the chait of May Marie, or whatever the chait was. Now, L'chaira, you'll remember that 40 years before, 
when they left the time, he actually was told by Hashem to hit, or hit the rock, and he did so. So he said, Rabbi Franz said, the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu is so upset is he's been with his people for 40 years, and he's remembering the first time they asked for water, and they're still doing the same complaints. They're complaining. Meaning, it's like you worked with someone for so many years, and you don't see any progress. So that's an understandable attitude. But what's the problem? There was some progress. Because in Parshas B'Shalach, they said, why did you take us out of Mitzrayim, Laham Mis Osanu, to kill us? Forty years later, they say, why did you take us out of Mitzrayim, Lomus, so we would die in the desert? The first time, they accused him of wanting to kill them. The second time, they just said, we're going to die. Does haste progress. They're not in the same place where they were. They improved a little bit. Moshe should have been Ome. That's also improvement, right? So uh, even modest improvement is improvement. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, uh, this is a difficult question. I mean, the, wor the world does change, the Metsiyas changes. Now, this is encapsulated in the Gemara itself. The Gemara talks about walking in streets where people are not dressed Sineas, and the basic rule is, Ika Dracha Acharina. Do you have another way to get where you're going? Now, if you look in the Rishonim, it's very clear, we're not talking about Bikuach Nefesh. We're not saying, oh, it's life and death. Uh, we're talking about even normal activities. I want to get a pair of shoes. If I don't have a sneer sticker road, in, in other words, what I'm saying is, whatever the legitimate activity is, we then ask, could I pursue it in a kosher way or not? If I can't pursue it in a kosher way, I am permitted to pursue it uh, even in, play, in venues that are not Sanua. It might be as minor a thing as, uh, you know, uh, getting shoes or getting a Coke or a falafel or, or, or whatever it would be. So we're fairly makeal on this. Even, go, even going to the gym is a paradigm. But, but once again, let me point out that the post can say there's a strong element of subjectivity here. By that I mean the following. If a person has uh, a powerful libido and there actually is like sexual arousal, then you have to be much, much stricter. But if the pshat is, you know, you're handling it, uh, but it's just a technical prohibition because it's a monkum chain of Sanua, then yeah, even the gym. I mean, I have given permission to people to go to go to co-ed gyms at times when, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of people are there, a lot of men are there, and they could go to the side where they're not directly staring at people. Uh, and you know, I, and I've been, uh, I've seen as well. I, I've seen very, very, from people who I know to be B'nai Torah and Tamadei Chachamim, who have uh, gone to uh, different exercise programs in which women were participating as well. Usually older women, so it wasn't, uh, but still, uh, technically that was, it was not B'gidrei Tzniyos. So this is Nichlal in, in Ika Dracha Achrina. Uh, so if you could get a separate gym, by all means, uh, you should try to do that. But if not, and you need the exercise, and it's something that's important for your health, then that would be nichlal in Ika Jorach I mean, I don't want to be too makel. Could this be extended to mixed swimming? Again, we get into many, 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 many questions. But Jorach is a fairly uh, lenient idea. Uh, but it also depends on, <coughs> on the libido. The libido is a major factor. In fact, that's true with everything. Hilchos Yichud. Hilchos Yichud, you can't compromise in Hilchos Yichud. But let's say a person has a situation where I'm meeting with a woman and everything's fine, the door's open and uh, whatever it is, but Lamaisa, if it affects you, can't do it. Meaning before we get to the Halachic Shaila, we have to get to the Metzias, is it Mashpia on me? 
if it's mashpia on me, then even hilchos yichud is not going to be is not going to be a hatsala. You get to hilchos yichud only after you determine that I can handle it. And of course, how do you know? But you know, you have to be honest. You have to be honest with yourself. Sean, do you want to ask Sean one question? Yeah. Um, uh, some very, very powerful questions. And uh, in some ways, uh, you're just talking to me, you're preaching to the choir because th there's much, much of what you said that I actually 100% agree with. Uh, let me just speak in defense, though, of the other side. Uh, and that is, a lot of Jewish life is operating on what you might call a state of emergency in the post-Holocaust years. It's, it's, it's amazing. What people are calling ancient history is really history since 1945. And that's about it. Uh, it was said B'Shem the Chazonish, who really is, the Chazonish is really the architect. It's amazing. Uh, it's very rare that you find a virtual single person who formed the whole cult. I mean, he wasn't the only one, but he was by far the dominant one, who formed the dominant culture and Veldashan of the Haredi world in Eretz Yisrael was the Chazonish. And the Chazonish had a shita that in the aftermath of six million Jews dying and, and the yeshivas of Europe being destroyed, it was a state of national emergency that required every person who could do full-time learning to go up into that procedure. Now, the Chazanish was asked, how long do you think that would be necessary? He said, at least 75 years. Interestingly enough, the time is up. And in reality, Go, this goes back to Messiah, meaning in reality, a certain type of cultural norm has become nishtarish, which may actually be dysfunctional in some ways, it may be atypical. It was actually not the Messiah of Am Yisrael, uh, and it was adopted as a state of emergency in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and serious thought has to be uh, put into whether this needs to be modified. Now, there are some voices that are talking about this, even Rav Steinman, before he died. And he was attacked. Rav Steinman was attacked when he departed from the official line, right? So even the Gadol is not protected when he doesn't say the standard line. Rav Steinman said, perhaps we need to explore, not university, that would be too much, but Parnassa Institutes, most those where people could support their families. Rav Moshe Hillel Hirsch, who is right now the senior Rosh Hashiva in Eretz Israel, says, at least quietly, 
that we have to recognize that a person can be a ben Torah, <coughs> even if they're not in the Dalit Kosle Beis HaMikrish, in the working world. In America, many of you might know Ravaren Lepiansky, who wrote a very, very fine book about <coughs> ben Torah for life, meaning how to be a ben Torah in the working world. I think there is a recognition that the old paradigm is not fully working. It works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for other people. Let me explain this. Even in terms of ruchnius, it's not always the best way. Not everybody is cut out to learn full time. And forcing them into kolel often creates depression. It creates a lack of shalom bias. It creates family tension. It's a very difficult issue. You can't have a one size fit all society, religious or otherwise. And I can tell you that people are considering options, modifications. They get criticized, they get knocked down. It still takes a certain amount of courage to be willing to publicly discuss these alternatives. But I, I can tell you they are being discussed, including army, including army, uh, including creating uh, more religious units, including creating Parnassa institutes uh, for B'nai Torah, which would keep Sunia separate men's and women's. I mean, they have some already, yeah, but, but they want to expand it. Right now, they're considered to be chutzlamachana a little bit, uh, not, not fully legitimate. So the issues you're raising are, are very, very important issues to society in Eretz Israel in particular. Uh, and as I say, uh, it was based on what the Chazanish established as a state of emergency in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and somehow it became the norm over those 70 years. It's interesting that People forgot about the Chazanish's quotation of 70 years, but Jonathan Rosenblum, other people are resuscitating it. And if you know the Haredi world, people like Jonathan Rosenblum are, they're putting out the feelers. It's an opportunity to ask a quick yeah. quote. Yeah. Which is, you want the Dati or the Haredi to come into the army? Now allow our generals to become uh, selected from the Dati for the change. To be what? To be? Selected from the Dati uh, that's, right. that's right. That's and, uh, right. The, the two who is overrepresented amongst the soldiers, there's uh, overrepresented amongst officers, but they're ignored when it comes to being generals. That's a very good. That's a very good point. That, that, that's a very good point. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the other side has responsibilities. If they want integration of the religious sector, they have responsibilities to bring in the religious sector in positions of authority. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. So again, I, I, your, your, your points are very well taken. But let me just say another point, though. Um, there is a certain element of fear that's going on here as well. Because like this, with all of the chesronos in the existing Haredi system, you know, we've created a cadre of people who are long de Torah, etc., who are committed to learning. And, you know, within a certain framework, it works. So now you're talking about opening up the framework, enlarging the options. There's a certain amount of fear that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Are people going to leave the fold? Are they going to go off the derech? We don't know. So some of it is being motivated by, by fear, and the fear in some ways might be well-founded. I mean, that's part of it as well. Change is always difficult. So that's all, all I can say, partial defense. Uh, Fisher? Um, I have a question. I'm a kind of Yeah. I was the, from what I understand, the Haredi argument is that we're not in the kind of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what's the ground? Okay, so so the pastures is the following. The, the, the Rambam says there are three types of uh, milchames mitzvah. Two of them are not that relevant today. One is the seven nations of Canaan, because they're, they're gone. There are no Hittites around. Uh, the other is Amalek. Amalek, at least genealogically, we can't really identify. But the main one is number three, Lahoshia Yisrael, the Yadzar, to protect the Jewish people from an enemy that is attacking the Jewish people. Based on that simple paradigm, one would say the war against Hamas is a Milchamas Mitzvah. What, what would be the argument that it's not a Milchamas Mitzvah? So some want to bring in, it's very schwer, a Russian of the Rambam in the Sefer HaMitzvahs, that even a Milchamas Mitzvah requires a, an official declaration of war by a melech 
So some want to argue, even Lahoshia as Yisrael Miyad Sar does not have a shame of Chemes Mitzvah without a Melech. Laniyas Daiti, that's very, very schwer, because it's one thing to say, we're not going to wage war against Amalek, we're not going to declare war against Amalek aggressively. It's another thing to say, defensive wars require a Melech, but somebody breaks into my house with a gun, I can't do anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's one problem. Uh, the other issue is Rav Cook. Rav Cook wrote, of course, Rav Cook is Rav Cook, so Haredim wouldn't necessarily accept him, but Rav Cook writes that anything that requires a Melech can be satisfied by an elected government. Uh, and, and the Ramban is much that way as well. The Ramban in the Sefer HaMitzvah says, Melech omi shahat sibor masorlo, implying any type of political leadership. Okay, but let's raise another aspect to the question. Let's assume it is a Melchemist Mitzvah. Let's not go with the mm -hmm. Melech requirement. Okay, who has to participate in Melchemist Mitzvah. So everybody quotes the Mishnah in Saita that says all of the exemptions like Chasan and uh, Kerem and Bayis only apply to Melchemist Rishutz, but Melchemist Mitzvah, Hakol Yaitzin. Well, it's not so posh because Hakol Yaitzin is referring to the Chasan doesn't have an exemption, etc. Does it apply to a Talmud Chacham or a learner of Torah? Is a full time learner of Torah exempt from Muhammad's mitzvah. So some want to bring the Rambam in Hilcha Shemitah V'yayvel, where the Rambam has a lotion, it's really combining two things in the Rambam, that Shevet Levi is the tribe that's totally devoted to Avodas Hashem, and they're not Yaitzei L'Milchama, even Muhammad's mitzvah, the Sifri says. In the Torah, they were not to Midian, they're, they're, that's true. But, but he says, but the Sifri actually says, as a general rule, Muhammad's mitzvah, Levi is Pater, so that's already a chiddush, a shevet levi pator. That's a big chiddush. And then they want to say the Rambam says at the end everybody can be a shevet levi, even though he's not talking about Mohammed. No I mean, after all, I can't be a shevet levi for everything. I can't be a shevet levi to eat meiser. So obviously the Rambam doesn't mean everybody can be a levi. But they want to add the one and one together, the pator for uh, a shevet levi, and then everybody can become a levi. Now. The first thing I want to say is, even if you accept that reasoning, that does not translate into a Haredi exemption. I mean, you have to, there, there are two different things going on here, and they're not the same. One is, if I am learning Torah full time, am I obligated to go to the army? The other is, if I'm Haredi, am I obligated to the army? I mean, just because there's no there's no Haredi exemption for Milchamis Mitzvah, no matter what you say. And the only argument would be it's not a Muhammad's mitzvah. You know, that would be the argument because you need a melech. So, what can I say? I mean, uh, there are uh, histor historically, the argument has been there was no manpower shortage and there was just no need for Haredim. And just like the United States, I know, I remember myself, uh, recognized an exemption for theological students. The yeshivas were the most crowded uh, in history uh, during that period of time. Uh, so too. Now, that argument is was, was a sustainable argument for a long time. As this war is dragging on, it, it becomes less of a sustainable argument. So what's the other argument people make besides the Talmud Chacham argument? They make the argument the army is going to be a negative influence on our kids. And I understand that. But you know, it does go both ways. I mean, there is the Hester guys who are wonderful Makachi Yashem. But 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 there are indeed the kids. There's Kira going out of the army. That's something to come from. But a lot of kids do go off the derrick. So if I'm a parent, I really get why I would be very concerned, for sure. The question is, is that a halachic patur? As, as painful as, as, as this is to say, and I'm just saying it, I'm just thinking out loud, I'm not, I'm not saying anything. I'm worried what will happen to my kid in the army, and that, that, that may be a legitimate, well, obviously. Well, 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 no, 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 for physically that's true, yeah, obviously I'm no better than anybody else, but I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, que the, the question is, is that, does that fear translate into a halachic exemption, Milchamet Mitzvah. There's a lot of unfinished thoughts here, going on here, 
that are not fully articulated. You know, you say one thing and someone says, well, what about my kids? Okay, but, but, you know, what's gonna be? So I can tell you that there's a lot of talk going on behind closed doors. And there is a recognition that uh, both for political reasons, moral reasons, and even religious and halakhic reasons, there's gonna have to be some accommodation uh, with the army. And of course, that does require that the army accommodate as well. Nachal um, Khariri, they've done some stuff, but there's a lot more stuff that can be done uh, to make it uh, to make it better. And things are changing. You know, the, the, the Chinese have uh, an expression. They have a curse. May you live in interesting times. <laughs> That's a curse, right? And uh, the Haredi world is undergoing a very, very interesting time right now on many, many levels. The types of schools, the introduction of some secular studies, Parnassa Institutes, the creation of multiple options for different types of people, our relationship to the army. Uh, these things have to be rethought. You know, when Ben Gurion agreed to exempt religious people in 1948, this was a condition of forming the first government of the state of Israel. The whole yeshiva population in Eretz Israel was under 400 people. And Ben Gurion was convinced that it was not going to grow. Either we're going to die out and they'll disappear. So it's a temporary little annoying problem that will go away in five to 10 years. So he signed off on it. Baruch Hashem in many, many ways. Ben Gurion was proved totally wrong. Uh, right. And we have the Chazanish and the Briskarev and all the people who built up, Panevicharev, who built up Tyre and Eretz Yisrael. But you know, that creates a new problem, meaning the whole predicate for all of the exemptions has less of a justification today. And uh, therefore, things have to be rethought. So uh, all I can tell you is that we're in a big, big process of rethinking. If you go to any place like Ramat Beit Shemesh, you'll see all sorts of new schools. Mm -hmm. Haredi schools are being established with different emphases, different approaches, different constituencies. So it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all anymore. It'll be more like America. Some people say, that's awful. I'm not even opining it's good or bad. Uh, some people say, that's great. That's what. That's exactly what we need. Whether you think it's good or whether you think it's bad, for sure it's coming until and unless it's arrested by the coming of Mashiach, which will have different rules once that, uh, once that happens. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh, we had a, well, yeah, yeah, no, without a base of Mikdash. Yeah, without a base of Mikdash. Yeah, without a base of Mikdash. Yeah. yeah. What's your outlook for the next 20 years? How positive are you? Or how, like, what's your, are you super positive? Are you worried? Are you buy property? What's your outlook? Well, they say that uh, property in Yerushalayim has never gone down. Uh, yeah. So it's always good to buy. Uh, I remember people. Buying in Harnof before the building built thirty thousand shekel, unbelievable. You know, so uh, there's some good. There were some good bargains then, some good bargains now. So I'm, I'm going to say two things. I'm going to say uh, good news and bad news. You know, the bad news is people sometimes say we have a divine promise from Hakadosh Baruch Hu that there will not be a third, there will not be a third Golas. and therefore for sure the state of Israel can never ever be destroyed. Uh, that unfortunately is not a true statement because it's true that HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised that the temple will not be destroyed a third time, but we're not out of the second Golas. Uh, we're still in the second Golas and therefore anything can happen, as it were, including Rahman al uh the Chorban of, of, of a Jewish state. So the Jewish state uh, indeed is a very precarious footing. On the other hand, we have seen over many years already, 70 years, more than 70 years, we've seen the rachamim of Hashem, we've seen the love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So I think we have every reason to be optimistic. I, I wouldn't put it as a promise. I don't think you have any prophetic promise to that effect. But I think Hashem is showing us a track record. Uh, but 
once again, it also depends on our doing our part, whether it's Torah, mitzvos, avas, Yisrael, whether it's uh, coming together. You know, the events of October 7, which we're still suffering, I mean, can you imagine? We're coming up to a year, almost a year. It'll be a year in just a few weeks, and it's still going on, and there are chatufim who are still suffering, and it's just unbelievable, and there's no particular... You know, there's no particular end of this. Uh, you know, this could go on, uh, who, who knows? Uh, and if there was any silver lining to a very difficult and tragic experience that we're still going through, it's that it brought us together in ways that we had not seen for many years. Uh, well, that's the thing. If you remember before October 7, there was this absurd debate about judicial reform, which somehow turned into an anti-religious attack. It's not even clear to me how that happened, but whatever it is, all the years that the Knesset was leftist leaning without any religious influence, uh, the secular people of Tel Aviv were perfectly happy to talk about pro-democracy, pro-Knesset. When there began to be more of a religious influence in the Knesset, the Supreme Court became their great protector, and when you want to rein in the Supreme Court, you know, chas v'shalom, you're creating a dictatorship and, and the like. What's so amazing is, even Biden, and he should be well, Biden made a statement, he was not in favor of Israel limiting the power of the Supreme Court. His proposals, which will, will, which will go nowhere, are many, many times more radical than whatever Netanyahu is. He wanted to have term limits on American Supreme Court justices, mandatory retirements at 75. They would have to amend the whole Constitution. So he's criticizing Israel, Netanyahu, who would really be creating a system very much similar to what the United States already has, when Netanyahu was doing something much more radical. Okay, whatever it is, I don't want to get into judicial reform. I mean, I, yeah, I no, no, I'm saying Biden uh, was criticizing Netanyahu. Okay, whatever. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to get into judicial reform, although I have a law degree, so I'm interested in in those technicalities. But the point I want to make is, it was tearing apart society. People were talking about leaving Eric Israel. Investors were talking about pulling out their capital. Soldiers were talking about not reporting to the army. And reservists were saying they weren't going to come. Baruch Hashem, they came. But who knows if that emboldened Hamas to think that there wouldn't be a response. People were talking about the end of the state of Israel. This, these were seriously articulated concerns. Comes October 7th. All of a sudden, we love each other, we care about each other, we're making sitzes for the chayolim, the chayolim want sitzes and tefillin, and the most Haredi families are bringing food and medicine and barbecues and everything else. And there was avas Yisrael, there was achdus, there was care, there was concern. But unfortunately, as the war drags on and on and on and on and on, we come back to our bad habits, just like an elastic band. You stretch the band. But at some point you let go and it just goes back to where it was. So unfortunately, we're kind of coming back to where we were. And that's a tragedy on top of a tragedy. The tragedy is, are the events of October 7 and the war. But if we could grow from that, if we could learn from that, if we could be transformed from that, at least there would be some redeeming quality. If we have the tragedy and we have the machlokas and the sinashrinah, what are we left? What are we left with? What are we left with? So that I think is among the most saddest things. In fact, even one of the hostages who was released, I think, made that statement. She she said that um, this was an opportunity for everybody to come. I don't, I don't think she was even religious. She just said this was an opportunity for the Jewish people to come together. She even mentioned that she was watching uh, with her with her captors. They were watching TV. They were watching a rally. And the captor, the guy, the Arab, the terrorist, said to her, he wasn't so happy about it, said, when the Jews get together, they're very strong. <laughs> he said, when the Jews get together, there's nothing they can't do. The guy was not the terrorist. You shouldn't overestimate the importance of the, the lefty elite and the terrorist uh, sect compared to what's going on in the whole country. I understand. I, I understand. I understand. So, so all I can say is that if we think about what we can try to do in the coming year. Once again, I think Abbas Yisrael asked us to kind of show 
even if you don't go into the army, but to show that it's your tsara, that you commiserate, that you're no say all, that you regard this as your struggle also. And open our hearts to feel the pain of others and recognize that their pain is really our pain. It's not even a different pain. And in that way, we try to be misakin a little bit, the sinas chinam that keeps us in the galas and prevents the geula. So again, I want to wish you all a ksivach and uh, it was wonderful having you. And again, uh, bye annually. We hope uh, you'll we'll come. <laughs> um, I, I, I can consider it, but it's harder for me these days to travel, even though it's not, it's not, a, it's not a huge distance. Yeah, so it was limo. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Rabbi, it's 15 and you said goodbye, but is yeah. it a quick answer? One more question. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, Sean, I'm sorry. Uh, so I have a question about the Shia. Yeah. Yesterday it was talked about the mitzvah can't come from the sin. Is that something that was said? That yes, yes, I mentioned that rule, yeah. yeah. So how do you explain the genealogy of the Shia who loved him, his daughters, and the Buddha, Tamar, and Yes, yes, yes. So this is a very powerful point that the Zohar addresses. And the Zohar makes the point that Mashiach does not come through sin, but Mashiach comes through the appearance of sin. Meaning, meaning technically, there were no sins. I mean, this is before the Torah was given, etc. And Yehuda actually had a mitzvah to do lever with marriage on his daughter, right? So it's not that there was actual sin, but it comes to things that look bad. Uh, Rus coming in the middle of the night to Boaz. And the Zohar explains that powerful holiness, when it wants to enter the world, there are powers of evil that try to deflect it. And the powers of evil have to be deceived by, you know, there's an expression in English, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Here you need a, a sheep in wolf's clothing. The good has to come in the guise of evil. And that brings it under the radar. Now, Rav Cook applied this paradigm to a lot of modern things. He applied it to secular Zionism. He applied it to aspects of feminism. He said, hey, a lot of this stuff is not kosher. A lot of this stuff is wrong, but it's concealing certain fundamental truths that only can enter the world uh, through that guise. And Ruf Cook says, our avodas try to extract the kernel of goodness from the surrounding sheker in which it is encased. It's an amazing thing. That's, that's why Ruf Cook had this ability to see in the negatives many, many types of hidden positives. And he said, mystically, that is how goodness often comes into the world. It comes into the world through the guise of things that look improper. That way, to use the Kabbalistic terminology, the chitzonim, the external forces, do not have an achiza. They don't have a grasp on it because they think it's them. It's like a Trojan horse, like you fool. That's how you fool the enemy, so to speak. Just did a class on fear that it's really a stricken zero mean on fear. And on what? On? Michelle, we just did a class on fear. I was the. Uh, the good part of kefir, even though it's all right. <laughs> a class on kefir, and that sounds interesting. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so you learn of cooking, so Renan learns of cooking. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Uh, Rav Cook was an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Uh, you know, Rebel, he was uh, both the Shatran and the Masada Kedushin for Rebel Yashif. Because Rav Ari Levin went to Rav Cook and said, you know, I'd like my daughter to marry this Avrech. And uh, in the Haredi world, when sometimes Rav Kook would be put down, if, if you did it in Rav Yashif's presence, and you think, because people thought Rav Yashif would vat I agree with my negative remarks, he kicked you out of the house and you weren't allowed to come back in again. He said, you don't know who you are talking about. Get out. And uh, so we have to recognize what a, what a guttle he was, but uh, an amazing, controversial, creative thinker. So 100%. Uh, his thoughts are very, very different. Uh, I'll tell you one little story. One, one little story about Rav Cook uh, that Rav Soloveitchik used to think of. Rav Soloveitchik, from Mayu, Rav Yosef Rav Soloveitchik, was only in Eretz Yisrael once, shortly before Rav Cook's death. Rav Cook, I think, died in 35, I think. So Rav Soloveitchik was there in 33 or whatever, uh, because he was a candidate to be chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. 
which he didn't get, and whatever. And later, he was offered to be Rafa Rashi, but he didn't want at that point. At that point, he, he didn't want to get involved in Israeli politics. That would have been too much. So he, ta he talks about his meeting with Rav Cook towards the end of Rav Cook's life, and he says, people make a mistake when they talk about Rav Cook as a philosopher. Rav Cook did not think in linear sentences, in orderly, logical <laughs> compositions. He said Rav Cook was a spiritual personality not a philosopher, and he called him the most extraordinary spiritual personality he ever met. And he told the story, now this story happened many years before, so some, I don't know if he heard it from Rav Cook or, or, or from somebody else. He said in the early, uh, night, you know, uh, before World War I, in the early uh, uh, 20th century, Rav Cook made it, he was not the Shirat Roshi, he was the Rav of Yaffa, but he took a tour around the many kibbutzim in the area many of which were Shomer Atzair, many of them which were anti-religious mamish. And he wanted to get to know them, he wanted to meet them, he wanted to spend some time with them. So, that's correct, that's correct. I'm, I'm not sure if this is the same journey or a different one, but yes, they went together, they went together. That's right, Revisor Chanzon went together and he was Machshir Yep, yeah, yeah. So he writes, he comes to a kibbutz, now this story only mentions Rav Kook, so I'm not sure if it's the same, uh, event that you're talking about. And he asks the head of the kibbutz, or whoever runs the kibbutz, you know, could we organize a minion Friday night in Shabbos? So the guy says, no. He says, we don't do that here. He refused. So Rav Cook said, okay. So he dives the Achinas. He sits, he brought a, a little bottle of wine and, and some bread. He, didn't, he couldn't eat any of the food. The food was mamish, mamish treif. And this was a dining room in which Chilo Shabbos before Hesri, I mean, they were doing sewing machines, they were playing uh, 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 orchestras, there were radios on, and he was just sitting and talking with the people, just sitting and talking with them. Afterwards, he benched. Same thing happened, there was no minion Shabbos morning. Uh, same thing, he just sat with them. Uh, they had a Suda Shalishas, I guess they called it an afternoon snack or something, they didn't call it. <laughs> same thing. Uh, after Shabbos, Rev Cook uh, just says goodbye to them and says, you know, it was really wonderful spending time with you. I really so much admire all the things you're doing, and I hope that next time I'm here we could sit down for a meal together. It would be so nice. We could eat together, too. And he left. That night, the head of the kibbutz calls everybody together and says, we're koshering the kitchen. We want the rabbi to eat with us. And he said, if the rabbi would have given us one word of Musr, Kashra Shabbos, you know, we would have just kicked him out. We would have kicked him out that day. He never said a single word of Tochacha. He treated us with love. He treated us with respect. We want to make him happy. So again, it wasn't they wanted to make Hashem happy. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't believe in Hashem. But we want to make him happy. So we're going to make our kitchen kosher. And Rav Soloveitchik told that story as an instance of the extraordinary way Rav Cook influenced people. It was not through philosophical debate or argumentation. It was through the love and respect that he conveyed Rabbi, to people. Yeah. I don't know, but because we learned Rav Cook a lot and you know that, yeah. when people ask well, quite often when they get to share, like, what's the Makor? You said he's like a spiritual philosopher. Like, what's the Makor? Like, was it a Yerushalmi type of thing? Like, he just got this philosophical mm -hmm. thread of all of life through his learning? <clears throat> well, you know, Rav Cook got from many, many Makaris. Rav Cook was Sholev from Bavli, Yerushalmi, Medrash, Zohar, Kabbalah, Chasidus. Actually, the Balatanya was a big, big, big influence. I mean, he didn't know, I mean the books of the Balatanya, the Kute Torah, were a big influence on Rav Cook. His mother was from a Chabad family. Uh, Svazemis, he absorbed the Hasidus and Kabbalah, but what can I tell you? He was also a creative, original person who filtered all of the Torah thoughts that he had through his own critical intelligence, his own sensitive soul, his noticing the phenomena of the modern world. He didn't ignore it, he didn't close his eyes. He saw people going off the derech and he wanted to know why. He didn't simply say, these are bums but he wanted to analyze what is taking people off the derech, the good part of kefira, as you say, which is always the way, make a cheshpan nefesh instead of blaming other people. But his makoros were so many, his makoros were, were Torah. 
we're told. But mainly Hasidus and Kabbalah. He was, of course, a beloved Talmud of the Nitziv in Volodzhen. Not so much Rav Chaim Salavechik. The uh, Lamdanim, you know, went more to Rav Chaim Salavechik. Uh, the Nitziv was the more Bikiyas Derech and more Zionistic Derech, right? And uh, uh, the uh, Rav Kook was very close to the Nitziv. And the Nitziv actually said, the whole yeshiva of Elijah would have been worthwhile to produce one person like Rav Kook. The whole great yeshiva of Elijah produced all of the Gedol Hador of the next, of the next uh, generation. And uh, Rav Kook was greatly admired by many, but even in his lifetime he was attacked. And he adopted the stance of Chazal, meaning he never, ever responded with bitterness or criticism against people who were insulting him in very, very, very extreme ways. In fact, he even expressed gratitude. He says, they keep me humble and they keep me centered and maybe they prevent me from going off the derrick, he said, but you know. And uh, he was macabre all of those criticisms. The saber upon him, Yafas. Rav Yaisim Chaim Zanathal, who was the leader of the Haredi world in Yerushalayim, actually went with Rav Kook uh, at an expedition for Kibbutzim, etc. They were very good friends, uh, even though their Talmidim fought a lot. And he always called Rav Kook the Rav of Yaffa. He never called him the Rav of Yerushalayim, and he certainly never called him Rav of Rashi. And he explained to Shachman, he says, Rav Kook's derech of reaching out to everybody, of loving everybody, of being machshiv everybody, is the perfect way a Rav should behave in a small fishing village like Yaffa. But when you're a national figure, this is, this is what this is what Rav is about. When you're a national figure and you have to protect the nation, you can't. So Rav Zanuntel tells you can't be so compromising and so accommodating. So he says Rav Cook was the perfect Rav of Yaffa, and he says I would be that way too. He said I would be that way too in Yaffa. Yerushalayim required uh, more of a an ideological stance. Rav Kook apparently disagreed with that Nakuda, but that, that's that's a machlokas, that's a machlokas among Gedolim. Okay, and uh, we have to have covered for for both of them in that in that way. Thank you, okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you.